Hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm your host, Ron McKeefrey, and I am at home. Rare time to be at home. As most of you know, I've been, um, I took a new position with Cincinnati Bengals and um, have had quite a few events and speaking engagements and things along those lines. And so I got an opportunity to be home and um, wanted to get back at it here with our episodes. I apologize for the, the delay. Uh, combination of the events and um, you know taking a while to get my internet hooked up and job and the whole deal just um, haven't had a whole lot of time to be able to, to uh, put these episodes out but we are back at it today very excited about Jerry Shrek our uh, guest for today Jerry is a is the head strength coach at Bucknell University uh, very unique um, I, I came across Jerry you know I was looking for some for some information on ACL prevention, came across a product that he did, uh, got his product, and really enjoyed some of the concepts he put out, and I know you will too, so we talk a little bit about that. We also talk a little bit about um, the strength coach, athletic trainer dynamic. You know, that's something that, um, you know, is volatile in our business, and, um, you know, Jerry is a uh, strength coach, strength coach first, but he's also a certified and licensed athletic trainer. And so I asked him to shed some light on that dynamic, and we talk a little bit about um, the relationship between the strength coach and, uh, and the athletic trainer and how important that is to have a, a good working relationship. So uh, I know you're going to enjoy this episode. Before we get started here, I want to make sure we recognize Play uh, for the, being the sole sponsor of Iron Game Chalk Talk. They do a fantastic job, have a great product. If you're in the market for a flooring option right now for a facility, uh, reach out to Brett and Angelo, and they will definitely take care of you and uh, get you set up, get you a quote, get you uh, a mock-up, and um, I know you're going to be impressed with their product. So sit back and enjoy this episode, and we'll see you on the other side. All right, hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. Lucky to have Jerry Shrek with me today. Jerry is the head strength coach at Bucknell University. And, uh, you know, I came across Jerry uh, recently when um, looking into some ACL prevention tactics and came across a product that he had and uh, was very impressed by him. And, and I've co- you know, he, he's, he has uh, VarietyTrainer.com as a website that I've come across uh, several times in the past that he does a fantastic job with. But I uh, wanted to get him on the show. Know he's going to be able to share a ton of great stuff with us today. Jerry, thanks for coming on, man. Hey, thanks a lot. Tickle pick to be here, I'm telling you. It's awesome. <laughs> well, hey, Jerry, for the people that don't know you as well, you know, tell, tell them a little bit about you know, how you got into the field um, and uh, you know, a, a little bit about your current situation there at Bucknell. All right, well, I, I got, kind of got into the, the strength and conditioning when I was – I did a little bit of lifting, to <clears throat> be honest with you, when I was in high school. Nah, I really wasn't into it in high school. Um, I got to college, I kind of got into it more once I got to college. And, uh, you know, through my, you know, years of going to school, I, I actually ended up with two degrees in movement and exercise science with the major concentration in athletic training and sports medicine. Right. Um, so I'm an actual certified and licensed athletic trainer as well, which... As a strength coach, you know, that can come in real handy in the summer when you got to do conditioning drills. I don't need to go find another athletic trainer. I That's fit huge. the bill. Yeah. So yeah. For our school, they like that because they don't have to pay someone to stand out That's there right. while, I'm, while I'm doing stuff in the summer. So so that, that became good. But well, when I got out of college, um, I, I wasn't actually pursuing a career in strength conditioning. Um, I enjoyed it. I loved it. Um, but it did, I didn't think it would pay the bills, to be honest with you. Right. Um, so I, when I got out, I got a, a job working as an athletic trainer at a sports medicine clinic, and I was contracted to a, a uh, in Pennsylvania, high schools are, are ranked by A's. Like, uh, so I was at a AAA high school, which is a pretty big high school, sure. size high school for Pennsylvania, um, with a really good sports reputation in a in whole region, Pennsylvania. So like this is the type of place where... Friday night football games, the town shuts down. There's no oh, wow. businesses open. Everyone's at the football game type place. Yeah. Um, so I was there as their head athletic trainer. When I got there, um, 
to my surprise, well, I, mean, I shouldn't say that really to my surprise, but there was no one doing any strength and conditioning at the school. The kids kind of went into the weight room, and they had a weight room, a pretty decent weight room, man. And they kind of just did their own thing. Um, some of the coaches, like the wrestling coach, was doing stuff with his guys. The football coaches would go in there, but, you know, they had lift heavy. Lift, you know, <laughs> you're typical what you would think of as a high school football coach that doesn't really know a whole lot. Uh, you know, they go to clean squats and bench and all the, you know, standard protocol. Um, so I kind of started stumbling around and living in the weight room. And within a year working at the high school, I've actually, I actually started taking on and became their strength coach and their athletic trainer. Mm-hmm. So I stayed at that school for a little over three years, and an opportunity arose, uh, one of those kind of being in the right place at the right time, um, where I had an, an opportunity to potentially advance to the Division One collegiate level, because my, my, really my, my kind of thought process was I wanted to go up in the ranks. Right. Um, start at the high school level, build, 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 and you know where I end up is where I end up. Right. Um, so I had an opportunity, kind of took it, took a leap of faith, and, and went after a job at Bucknell University um, as an athletic trainer. And I I got the job and was hired. And when I got there, it, you know, another thing, they didn't have a strength coach at Bucknell either. So I'm like, wow, am I reliving the same thing I just went through at the high school level? They had a guy there that was doing strength and conditioning, but was only with the football team, and then he worked with the wrestlers a little bit on the side. He was actually a nurse. Right. Wow. Um, yeah, believe it or not. But the guy knew what he was doing. He, I mean, he had some credentials and things. Sure. Um, so as within three years, they started building a facility. But during that three years, I was – already kind of working as a strength coach because I my first assignment at the university was to work with uh, the women's volleyball program okay and they were not doing hardly anything with strength and conditioning and to make a long story short they kind of found out I was doing that before I got there and I wrote a program for a girl because she asked me and next thing you know the whole team started doing it and then the volleyball coach came across the program in the locker room and asked where did this come from right and they, she found out that I was helping the girls out. And next thing you know, I'm 6 a.m. in the morning. I'm training the volleyball team three days a week in the weight room. And it didn't take long for women's soccer to jump on there. Oh, yeah. Lacrosse team comes walking in. The men's lacrosse coach is asking for, hey, can you help our team out or else give us some guidance? And three years later, they're building a new facility. They want to put a varsity weight room in and uh, make it separate from the student body weight room and hire a head strength coach. Our head uh, athletic trainer at the time really pushed me and said, you know, this is your passion. Your passion is not an athletic trainer. You're a great trainer, but you, you, you want to do rehab 90% of the time o- over taking sure. angles. Sure, uh, sure. Or, or evaluating injuries. So, <laughs> um, you know, the opportunity was there. My passion was in that direction. It wasn't in athletic training necessarily. Right. And uh, so I took a leap of, I got another opportunities there, being in the right place, the right time. And I'm already doing the job at that point with seven teams. Um, so I had the backing of those coaches as well. And uh, the candidate pool that I actually went up against was actually really surprised that I got the job, to be perfectly honest with you, right. even though I was already doing it. Um, so I, I landed the job, and uh, I've been there ever since. Now, Buck, now you, you you have 27 sports, correct? You know, and and it's yeah. a and, and one you, club team. At one club, <laughs> that trains, huh? Yeah, and I used to be a powerlifting coach there too. I had a powerlifting team for a couple of years. Oh wow! That wow. got to be too much. I had to drop some. So. So it's a unique situation in that you have a ton of sports and you and you have uh, just a couple staff members, correct? Yeah, I have uh, two full-time staffers, uh, John Coach John Field, who predominantly oversees our football program. I have two weight two weight rooms. I have an Olympic-based weight room and a, a football-based weight room. The okay. football base is in the stadium, and our Olympic weight room facility, which is a bigger facility, is in our main uh, rec center okay. for athletes. Okay. And then I have a, a secondary 
uh, a full-time assistant who I just hired this past December, which has been a great help, uh, yeah. Cassandra Beyer, and um, she helps me with, and assists me in the Olympic weight room. But we all we all work together as a staff. We're not we're not one of those schools that we're separate. Football staffs, Olympic, yeah. no. I mean, I oversee everything. I mean, it's not like I'm disconnected from football. I mean, I'm still. I told you just a few seconds ago. I trained them two days two two days ago in the morning. Right. Um, you know, so we work great as a staff, and then we're still a little understaffed, but we, we get it done. Well, that's great. You know, it, you know, it's a it's a it's a great situation because it's a, it's a dynamic that as strength coaches we you know you hear quite a bit of. Um, Constantly, you especially go to tra- you know you go to, to conferences and things like that. All the, the athletic trainers or uh, you know this that they're you know taking our job. I mean the pure some of the purest you know in strength and conditioning would be like oh you were you're an ATC that just kind of fell into a strength job and you know talk talk a little bit about the the, the strength coach ATC dynamic and how that's kind of been maybe convoluted through the years because I'm you know. My take, and, and people on the show have heard me say this before, is that, you know, there's a, you know, when you have a, a great relationship with your athletic trainer, um, that can be, a, a, you know, a, an unbelievable dynamic for you, for the athletes. You know, now if you take a, a standoffish, you know, approach with your athletic trainer, that could also be very, uh, it, it can be poison in a program. So. Talk a little bit about because you, you're 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 certified and li- you know licensed as an athlete. Talk about that dynamic. Well, I'll tell you, I I've heard the horror stories from other strength coaches where they, the 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 strength coach and the trainer they kind of you sure. know they're clashing all the time on on things. Um, I I was put in a unique situation being already you know I I see both I've seen both sides of that world. Um, so being in that world, I think it makes it very easy for me to be able to communicate better with the trainers. The trainers know my knowledge base. They know that I am an athletic trainer. So um, I think the communication level there, well, I try to keep the communication level up all the time. I mean, if you got bad communications, you're going to cause problems. Right. It's just that's the reality of this field. So the, the athletic trainer and the strength coach, they got you. Got to be in constant communication. I mean, especially when you're working with high volumes of athletes like we are at Bucknell. I mean, I've got 660 athletes under my wings just in the Olympic sports alone. Sure. That's not counting football. So um, be, that dynamic needs to be there. And I, I've heard some horror stories from other strength coaches where it's just like. They're just banging heads all the time, and right. you know, it's just it is what it is. I mean, but you just try to make the best of your situation, I guess. Well, I think at. I think you touch on the right thing. I mean, it, it all starts with communication, and and you know, and anytime you can get down, sit down with the, with you know coworkers, because that's essentially what they are, coworkers, um, and iron out roles and responsibilities. That solves ninety nine percent of the problems, you know, and and. Uh, there's definitely been those times where I wish I was a certified athletic trainer too to say, "Hey, look, I know this stuff too." But um, but as long as you, you know, you know, coach, I, it definitely helps. I, I for 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 me because I, I know where you're going with that because sometimes a trainer might think, you know, the meathead guy in the weight right. room just wants to beat him up. You know, that's just the goal, and then we got to try and put them back together because they're so sore, broken down, and then this can lead to this without the education of them knowing what we're trying to do. So for me, that link, that barrier is there. Yeah. Um, if they, you know, I get an injury report or they come down and say, hey, so-and-so's got a labral tear, you know, posterior horn, whatever. I know exactly what they're talking about. They know I understand that. So I think that makes it a little easier in those regards. Sure. Um, and okay, so here's our plan of attack. They're going to tell me what they want to do with rehab and what they're going to be doing. And then I can say, okay, how can we marry that with our lifting program? Because I'm obviously I'm going to make modifications to that, right. that individual's workout. Maybe right. we can marry it because they still have to come to the weight room. Right. right. Unless the trainer shuts them down completely, which is very rare. Mm-hmm. Very, very rare. They still have to, they still have to come to the weight room in my, in my book. Oh yeah. Around everything. 
Well, they still got, you know, a, a left shoulder and a lower body and the, and the whole oh, yeah, thing, got, you know. They got toes that wiggle. We can still do something. No doubt. You know, I think, um, you, you know, just kind of, you know, closing the book on that subject, you know, I, I think showing a passion and, 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 and being engaging and not just dismissing injuries. Oh, here's an injury report. Okay, it's a labral tear. You know, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll work around it. Really showing a... a, a, a the initiative to go and say, hey, you know, you know, when you guys do that surgery, let me sit in on that surgery, or let me talk to the orthopedic surgeon, or, you know, let's let's have a let's have a conversation on the front end on, of, like you said, a plan of attack, of what the athlete can and can't do, and and when and, you know, anytime you do those types of things, you know, all that little stuff about getting somebody out there, you know, for water at at this conditioning group, or, you know, if they really got your back when things get sticky or. If you show a kind of an interest and a and, and a desire for the you know to um, for the for, to keep the athletes um, agenda number one or keep their you know their their safety number one, then um, usually it, it's 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 a it's a great relationship you know and I just I, you know I, I didn't mean to go off on a tangent on this I just sometimes I get upset with. You know, oh, they're taking our jobs, or oh, you know, it's such a, a, a bad, re- you know, it's it's only a bad relationship if you make it. They're only going to take your job if you allow them. You know, if we do a good job of what we do, then that doesn't happen. You know, and and uh, I think that's uh, you know, it's just one of those things that we need to get past if we're really going to grow as a profession. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I mean, I, I'd be actually be perfectly honest with you. I know we're way off track here, but we'll lead back into things. That <laughs> I've even gotten slack um, from some of our professional organizations in this field for being a certified licensed athletic trainer. Right. Uh, you know, you're well, you're not a strength coach then. No, I am a strength coach. Right. I just happen to have my certifications and license as well. Yeah. No, it's uh, you know, there's so again, I, you know, I don't want to get off on the tangent. But there's so many ways you can. I, I think you go back to, and we I've said this on the show, until we have a degree seeking program in strength and conditioning, we're going to continue to fight that fight because just like you in college, what interests you was uh, anatomy, physiology, and exercise science, and human movement, and so you went that direction. Well, that was just a nice, easy. You know, I, I might as well. I'm doing all the schooling. I might as well grab this certification. I might as well grab this license. You know, and, and where the road may lead you, you know, and, and initially it led you as athletic trainer, but it never changed your passion for, uh, you know, training and preventative, uh, you know, uh, maintenance and, and, you know, all exercise and the whole deal. And so, um, you know, again, it's just an area of, of things. But let's get off that, man. I, I, that's going to be it's a slippery slope, right? Um, let's, uh, you know, like I said in the onset, you know, I came across your product on um, on ACL prevention, and that's, you know, this is something that, you know, it's almost one of those, you know, ACL, you hear it and you cringe as a strength coach, and, and we've all had athletes that have had ACLs, you know, and, and uh, there's nothing worse than, you know, having an, an athlete that's a senior that's, that gets an ACL, and, you know, and that, that, that's the end of their career, you know. What, what, what do you attribute, because there's definitely a rise, you know, over the last – five, ten years, there's definitely a rise in the number of ACL injuries. What do you attribute that to? You know what? The pro- you know, a lot of people have asked me that, and I have three answers for that, to be honest with you. And I don't know if they're the right answers or the wrong answers, just they're opinionated answers. Sure. Um, because, I mean, if our training is getting better over the years – Shouldn't those numbers of ec- ec- injuries be going down? Right. And what we're finding, you talk to older people 40, 50, 60 years ago, ask them how many ACLs they knew of when they played sports. They're, if they even heard of any. Yeah, they wouldn't, they wouldn't know Think what it about, is. I mean, it's ridiculous. And I've done tons and tons and tons of research on this stuff and talked to tons of people. Talk to the older generation and ask them about ACL problems. They'll be like, we, I don't know of any. Yeah, they wouldn't know what it is, let alone our athletes now. They could point right to it. ACL tear. Well, so so the first thing, I think the reason why we're seeing a big rise in ACL tears is, well, we've got better diagnosis. Sure. We've got athletic trainers that are at high school games now that weren't used to be there. They're, I mean, we got physical therapists. We had 
doctors. The MRI technology is, is so vastly improved. So I think the recon being able to recognize those injuries earlier or just recognize them as an ACL tear in general right off right. the bat and then having the abilities with the, the surgeries, the way they've improved over the years. I mean, hey, you put a, put a knee in front of an orthopedic surgeon, he's ready to chop and put it back together. I got skills, he's saying. <laughs> uh, that, another thing here, and I don't want to get too long-winded, is I, I actually went to a, a strength conference uh, a couple couple years ago and a physical therapist was talking on ACLs and things and I think and he and he, he hit something that the way he described it I thought was pretty interesting as to why we're seeing why he thinks we're seeing an increase in ACLs and it and you're seeing this is because kids nowadays are really starting to specialize in one sport at a younger younger age right. um, I mean you, you take soccer for example I mean they can play school soccer in the fall they're going on a traveling team in the summer. Right. Then they're going on an AYSO team in the spring or whatever, and then they're doing an indoor league in the in the winter. Sure. They're playing year round. Um, so the stimulus is always the same. Versus years ago, everyone played three or four sports. You went from football or baseball, or soccer, whatever your sports were. Right. Then you went to basketball, wrestling. Then you went to baseball or, or whatever your sports were. You know, you played them through the year. So there's a different stimulus. The, the pro, neuro, neurological proprioceptors in the ligaments in the knee it is, according to this physical therapist and how he described it, he tried to describe it in layman's terms, which I'm going to try to do yeah. the same, is the ligament almost feels like it's laxed sure. because it's not being stimulated any differently. It's doing the same thing, and it's doing it all year round. It's right. not getting long. It's not getting downtime. It's not getting time to change what it's doing it's doing the same movement same pattern same repetitive over and over and over so the body gets used to that right so the mechanisms of protecting itself kind of lacks up for better terms right so that was that was an interesting concept that i never heard anyone actually talk about i have no specialization not, in sport not to mention they're not they're not climbing trees and dropping out of trees and landing mechanics and running around on a playground and falling right. and rolling and you know, they're, they're not getting into that anymore now either, you know. And, and that leads me to what I think is the number one reason why most AC, we're seeing an increase in ACLs. What is our youth doing today? Mm -hmm. Okay. They may go and they may have a practice and they may practice hard, really right. hard for two hours. But then what are they doing for the next 22 hours? Right. 90% of the time, they're sitting on their butt. They're in front of a computer like we are right now, right. in a seated position, or they're playing their video games, they're texting someone, they're on their cell phone, they're inactive. Mm -hmm. And being in, staying in long, in, in their school all day long, sitting in a chair, and in being in the seated position, I firmly believe that we are actually seeing this shortened shorten position of the hip flexors. Yeah. Again, top, I'm seeing it in the pelvis. I'm seeing it, and I'm, I'm seeing it more every year. I keep seeing it. It's becoming more because I'm looking for it now. Sure. I see it as more predominant. And in doing that, I think what we're actually seeing is by the shortening of those hip flexors, we're actually starting to see an increase or a, a decrease of the uh, activity in the glutes. Yeah. Um, Ten years ago, if you were to ask me, hey, hey, Jerry, what what's the biggest weakness you see in athletes I would say probably hamstring to quad ratio right and I, I think that sometimes you still you know that's still an issue um, but I don't think it's as big an issue nowadays as what I see in the hips yeah um, I actually have kids that don't even know how to use their butt yeah and that's the one of the biggest most powerful muscles in the lower body is the glutes and right. What I'm finding is more and more of these athletes we're getting in, they don't know how to fire their glutes. Right. And you see it when we're doing triple extension movements. They don't even know how to, yeah. how to get the hips to pop correctly. Yeah. One, they're not getting the fire mechanism in the glutes. And then you find out, you know, that you, when you do some more evaluating, you're finding all this tightness in the hips and the hips and the hips, especially in the hip flexor region. And I really believe it's you know, do the inactivity of our right. our youth compared to what when I was a kid, I'd go to heck, I'd go after school, I'd go down, sure. track practice, 
and then I go right from track practice over to soccer practice, and then I go home, throw some food in my mouth. I'd be outside playing kickball or yep. capping the flag or building a fort in the woods or something until I'm getting yelled at by my parents to come in and get showered up and go to bed. No doubt. Kids nowadays aren't doing that. No doubt. No doubt. You know, that, and that glute, it's a, it's a big muscle that if you're not using, then those smaller muscles start to, to – they'll fade over time, no doubt. You know, talk a little bit about, um, you know, the role the weight room has in – uh, you, you you said it. You, you related back to, to obviously glute development. I think that's probably the missing link. But what what are things that you, you that are must haves in in your in your strength program? What are things that are that you cringe when you see uh, in a strength program per se? You know, must haves in, in my program are. I'm a big fan of standing exercises. I mean, most of my stuff is going to be, you know. I, I do a big variety of, of big lifts. Um, you know, we do our squats. We're going to do our hang cleans. Um, I, I'm a kettlebell guy, yeah. so I do like the extension and, and the, the with the hip hinge exercises. I'm a big hip hinge guy. Yep. Um, and I, but I do go after those glutes. I'm always going after the glutes with our athletes, and and I'm also I'm always in a constant state of evaluation. And when I get my interns in and these young guys and girls who want to be strength coaches are volunteering at our school, we do get some volunteers from other colleges. And I, I constantly tell them, okay, did you see Did you see the way they just squatted? Mm-hmm. What did you see wrong? Or watch, watch them bench. Right. What's happening in the elbows right there? Did they wing up right away? I mean, what's, what is that telling you? So I'm trying to teach them. Where's that weak link in the chain? Sure. And and then I attack that weak link. And so every athlete in that room might have certain exercises written on their program. But as soon as I see it, I'm going to attack it. I'm going to go right. after it right away and, and go hammer it home. Right. Um, and then one of the big things that we do is we, we start with, um, in that evaluation process, is, and I've really been doing this more and more, and more over the last five years, six, seven years um, is evaluating if we even get glute activation. Right. Um, you know, just by doing simple body weight movements. Um, I do that a lot with our incoming freshmen. But I also do it with our upperclassmen as well when they first come back. If they haven't been with us over the summer, right. uh, they've been home on their own. I'm going to evaluate them right off the bat with doing some simple box hop stuff. Um, you know, landing, seeing, watching how they land watching what the knees are doing, watching if they're, how they're transferring their weight. I mean, right. that's vitally important. And that's probably the biggest things that I've, I've started to really hound in on over the, you know, I've been doing this a long time now. Um, getting a little old. But, uh, <laughs> are um, we all? But, I mean, I've learned that over the years to follow and just, and I'm seeing the weakness in the glutes so much more than I ever have in the right. glutes. Words. Well, weakness and then, uh, and, you know, uh, asymmetries as well, you know, difference between right and left, you know, and, and um, I've noticed that quite a bit with, especially if you're doing some single, uh, you know, single leg glute bridges or something along those lines. Uh-huh. Sometimes they can get, you know, that right, you know, that right glute, but a lot of times they can't get that left and just that self-assessment of being able to hit that, you know, hit that glute and see if it's contracting or not is a good eye opener as well. What, are there some things that you you um, that you see you know that in other programs where you cringe you go ah I don't I, you know I don't know if I'd be doing that or that's you know uh, you know or is it just simply making sure that you're hitting the glutes and, and coaching up technique? Um, I don't I don't tend to really criticize other people's lifting programs because I'm not in their weight room and I don't know what led them to do those exercises. Sure. Um, necessarily um, I mean yeah I, I mean <laughs> the YouTube generation and things you can see some wild stuff on there I mean I'm yeah. not going to have my guys standing on stability balls trying to press a barbell over their head that's just dumb yep. uh, you got to risk versus reward and what's going to give you the best output um, when you're, you're doing your programming and uh, when you're evaluating how to make your program with each team um, as you're setting up 
you know, where, what's your goal? Right. And then how do you get to your goal? But do it in a in a realistic way to get the most results. But yet, um, produce an athlete who's going to be healthy on the field. Yeah. So yeah. you know, yeah, I've seen some wild stuff out there, and I and I, I've learned from mistakes. I've done some things, probably you know, not probably. I know I've done things over the years that I I thought, wow, this is going to work out great, and then wow, partway through <laughs> the workout, I'm like. This is coming off, and we're, 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 and I'll stop. We're gonna change. We're gonna do something different. Right. Um, you know that you know, coach. You got these. You always have cards in the back of your pocket. You no know, doubt. Something ain't working. There ain't no sense in riding it out. Change right. it. Get rid of it. Move on. Well, you know, you talk a little bit about the video, and, and, and you know, you talk about the role of of um, you know the weight room and getting the glute, you know the glute strong and coaching technique and doing the box yeah, I really like the deceleration box you know, box hop that you that you do as part of your, your your squat program but you know as a strength coach I'm constantly making the, the you know the, the telling our athletes that you know the weight room is one piece you know and, and the number one job of the weight room for those athletes is to make them better on the field or the court or wherever it may be and so transferring that you know transferring that strength to movement you know and and um you know, in the in the video, you talk about three stops. You know, you kind of you kind of you kind of brought things down to a you know, like uh, you said it all off camera. You know, you wanted to make it as simplistic as you could, but there's really kind of three stops that you go through as an athlete on the court or on the field. And talk a little bit briefly about what those are and and, and how you would incorporate those into your programming. Yeah, um, over the years, when. I mean, I, I don't want to get long-winded, and I can't be long. I think every strength coach can be long-winded. No doubt. We can be talking on passion and things and stuff. Um, but, you know, I, I started this whole thing and how I came about figuring some of this stuff out or coming up with this systematic progression is just by observing athletes out on the field and on the court. Um, how are they How are they stopping? How are they starting? How, what's the position? And then, you know, when I worked at the high school level, I had a lot of ACL tears. Uh, I, I think I had like six or eight of them my very first year. And I went, whoa. And then, you know, they got the strength conditioning. I thought, well, I start training them in the weight room. The, you know, the, the these injuries are going to go down. Well, guess what? They did. Right. Um, we still had like five, I had five the second year. And I'm like, well, something ain't right here because I you train with weights. You're supposed to be getting right. low, lesser injuries. So over the years, I've watched and I talked to everyone and anyone I could, but then I found out, I started observing and really breaking down field mechanics and movements. So I came up with these three positions. One's called the athletic stop, which is really what most strength coaches might actually consider their ready position. Um, they, they get the feet are kind of a little wider than the shoulders, kind of sit down into it with their hands out, they're ready to, you know, to do any type of, of movement that you know, like a basketball player would do or something. Right. Um, <clears throat> and then I took that and then I looked at the neck and I started breaking it down. Okay, so what about single leg things? So we're going into a lunge stop. I have a lunge stop left and a lunge stop right. Um, so going out into what you would think of as a forward lunge, okay, now – those positions, if you go down all the way down to where your knee's about an inch from the floor, if you're doing a regular forward lunge, you know, those positions aren't necessarily happening and occurring a lot on a field. But going into those positions and coming out of those positions in different ranges of motion, they may not be very deep, they may be deep, sure. are happening con consistently in any almost any sport. So I have what's called lunch stop right and lunch stop left, and then I also have um, another another one of our another our major stoppings is what I would call a hockey stop right or a hockey stop left, which is basically slowing down and coming in almost into a 180 degree um, turn. If like um, I relate that to if you're a soccer player or a lacrosse player and you're going down the field and all of a sudden there's a change of play and it's going the other direction, well, you've got to turn your body to get in the other direction. And that's right. where that hockey stop comes into play. Mm -hmm. um, but then getting into those positions but doing it correctly with the right 
I would like to say the right neurological firing patterns so that they can actually control their momentum because if you can't decelerate properly your acceleration is not going to be very good right it's not I mean and that's you know everyone's so many people and I think this is at the lower levels this is what uh, is a lot of times the problem is everyone's focused on acceleration 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 and in 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 perfect reality if you can master deceleration acceleration is gonna it's just gonna come as a byproduct right I mean because this right neuro the, and, and master deceleration in the right positions right so that the body's not you know an ACL tear you know you got contact and you've got non-contact ACL tears unfortunately there's not a whole lot we can do with contact right we can get the body strong, but if you're alignment and you get rolled up on underneath, it's going to happen. Trying, it's part of sport to some degree. There's a 330-pound lineman that rolls up your back leg, and you're in the wrong position. It doesn't matter how strong you are, that knee's going to go. Right. And it sucks, but that's just, it is what it is. That's right. But if you're sprinting down the field, and you're going to go, and you're going to cut to the left, and you're planting on that right foot to make that cut, if you're quad dominant, Okay, and this is where this is really the, the take home of my my system. If you're quad dominant, if you're relying on decelerating and accelerating with your quads, okay, where are the quads? There's four muscles that come down over the knee and they attach to the tibia. The ACL keeps the tibia from going forward. Okay, you want to change direction. You're planting. Your toes still facing that way. Your quads decelerating and accelerating. Well, it's still going to pull on that tibia. That tibia is still trying to go forward as you're trying to turn. And then you get that little bit of rotation and pop. Try it. That's, that's, that's a classic non, uh, non-contact ACL tear. I'd say that's probably where about 80% of those non-contact ACL tears occur. Yeah, you get some freaky ones where they right. jump and they land incorrectly or whatever. But most of them are from that, that movement pattern. Now, if your glutes fire... Okay, if you can learn how to plant and you go to stop and start, start, or, or if you're on a full sprint and you're going to plant and cut, if you're getting some glute activation to help decelerate, to accelerate you, because you want to triple extend, right. no matter what the movement, you are planting and turning, you're still going to triple extend through the ankle, knee, and the glute. Right. But if that glute's not triple extending and it's not helping you decelerate and, so now, and, and re-accelerate, you're relying on everything on your quad. Right. And so that load is being transferred. You're already kind of like mechanically setting yourself up for for issues. And that's where I kind of go back to, well, why are, why are we getting this inactivity of our glutes nowadays when you weren't seeing it 40, 50 years ago? Good point. Our, our kids are not. We're inactive. We're right. sitting on our butts and our hip flexors are being shortened and, our, and it's turning off our glutes. I read, uh, I'm, I'm actually uh, about three quarters of the way through The Supple Leopard by Kelly Sturette. I don't know if you know, have you, have you come across that yet? No, I haven't. But he had a good illustration of, you know, that external rotation with the, you know, with the ACL. And so what he did, I don't know if you can see it on camera here, but crossing your two fingers, you know, and if you have that internal rotation or you have a strong glute, internally, if you're squeezing in, it's, it's not going to go anywhere, but no matter what, if you have that external rotation, you know, it's always going to rip that finger off, you know, just like it would tear that ACL. And uh, it, was a good, it was a good visual illustration, um, a good takeaway with your athletes to say, hey, look, cross your fingers. You get that external rotation. You know, it's going to happen if we don't prepare against it. And that's a, that, was a great, um, that was a great point. I appreciate you bringing that on. With the um, – with the three stops, what I really liked about the three stops and what, how you incorporated it into your program was, you know, obviously you have a progression that you could do as a standalone, as an ACL prevention type program. But what's great about that is I started thinking about all the ways I can incorporate that into my normal training. You know, your four cone drills, you know, your five cone drills, your different pattern runs and things along those lines. So just coming to one of those three stops and illustrating that and, and and, and, you know, I really like the lunge stop where if you start to, you know, if you're not controlled, you're going to fall every time. Um, I thought there was That's some. Our freshman. Go ahead. That's our freshman. Yeah, yeah. Every time you do a five, we get to those five by five drills, and you 
you've seen the video yeah. and stuff, when you progress to those five by five drills, and the first time we do lunch stop rights or lunch stop laps live, yeah, where they're going to sprint and decelerate and come to that complete stop. I even tell them what they're going to do wrong. Right. And 90, 90, 95%, the knee goes forward over the toes and they, they fall, yeah. their body falls forward. Yeah, it's either that or it's 36 year old strength coaches that are trying it. I'm falling forward too every time I do it. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, talk about, you know, you know the, the video, you kind of have a, a built in progression to it. I started thinking about all the all the, the ways that I can incorporate into my, my basic program, which is what I really liked. I liked the, the incorporating the three different stops, really like that, like the offensive steps and the defensive steps you kind of go into uh, from the stop to reaccelerate. But talk about a, a little bit as a, as a standalone program, um, you know, how many times a week are you doing that? As a, you know, Are you doing it before the workout, after the workout, before conditioning or after conditioning? Okay, where does that fit in for you? Ideally, for me, now, if we're doing the box hop stuff in the very initial evaluation process, yep. I'll do that in our workouts in the weight room. Okay, but once we get out of the weight room, because ninety by 95% of this progression is, is all body weight stuff, and it's out of the weight room. Right. Um, so where I like to put that into is I like to do that right after our dynamic warm up after we're fully engaged before we get into any conditioning agility drills like it doesn't take a long time to do these drills right so if you're doing them excuse me, you're doing them you can knock them out in like 10 15 minutes once your athletes start to learn the drills and know what they're doing hey we're doing our 5 by 5 drills we're going to run offensive and defensive takeoffs we're going to go in athletic stops we're going to lunch stop left and right we're going to do our hockey stops we're going to do them live right or, you know or hey you know we're 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 past the five by five drills we're going to start doing our partner runs or our power runs yeah okay and we're going to still we're going to come we're all on the whistle you can do the whole team and i, I talk about that in the video how to train teams Yep. So it's not just like individual, but it takes it starts with the individual first. You know, you have yep. to really kind of evaluate everyone when you're doing it, and then build on that as you go. Um, but I like to do it preferably in the off season. Um, if it's an ideal, it's not always ideal at the college level. Right. Um, and uh, days of the week, one to two days a week. I don't, you don't have to, you don't kill it. You don't do it five days a week. You can get sore doing. You're gonna get your athletes are gonna get sore. Sure. Um, a lot of them when we first learn those five by five drills, they're telling me two days later when they're in the weight room, coach, I, my butt hurts. Yeah. That's because your glutes were being activated. Mm -hmm. um, you're learning how to use your glutes, and so we might do some more some specific dynamic movements just to loosen up their glutes. Right. We hit weights that day um, because they're complaining of sore glutes. Um, so I would like to, I like to do it in the beginning um, uh, on conditioning days or agility days, or um, if I have certain coaches that know what's going on. Like I, I can't be everywhere. You, you, I got twenty seven teams. Right. So what I've actually done is I have some coaches that I've taught this to, and they'll do it before practice. Yeah. They'll they'll spend. Five ten minutes, they'll run them through a handful of the drills, and That's right good. after their dynamic warm up, and then they'll get into practice. That's the beauty of it. it. Doesn't take a, I mean, yeah, initially the coaching of it, you're gonna have to coach them for a little bit, but after they got this down, after a little bit of time, boom. And how you uh, progress through the phases is really dependent upon the athletes. Sure. Um, you're going to spend more time if this is a junior high athlete you're talking about versus a, a D1 collegiate athlete who's going to learn things a little bit quicker. Sure. Um, you know, but I never force feed the progression, though. If a team's not ready to go on, we're not moving yet. Well, that leads me into my next question. You know, if you have, you know, obviously, you know, you're, you're, de you're dealing with different skill levels of, of athletes, when you, especially when they arrive as freshmen or, or going into the – you know, and then into their upperclassmen years where they start to separate themselves, even the good athlete versus the not so good athlete. 
when you have that that varying levels of 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 skill level, how do you in a team setting do those five by five drills or some of those other drills? How do you kind of yeah, and it, it, break it down? You know, give me some ways that you've broken it down and say, hey, this is maybe my group A, this is maybe my group C, or or, or how do you how have you done it? You're almost hitting it right on right nail on the head or mm -hmm. hammer on the head of the nail right there however the little certain saying goes sure um i'll split them up yeah. okay and it's not a, a disciplinary thing by any means i mean some of you guys are more advanced and it's typically the, the upperclassmen who have gone through it our freshmen it takes longer for them to learn and and get those things down so um Sometimes what I'll do is I'll take a coach, I'll, I'll utilize an assistant coach and teach them the system, have them learn it right. and say, hey, you know what, I'm going to be down in practice today. You're taking the upperclassmen, run them through these five by five drills, look for it, and I'm still going to keep an eye on things. It's not like I'm going to sure. be separated, but I'm going to focus with these freshmen and this 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 four other athletes because they're not ready to move they're they haven't they haven't mastered this yet yeah i'm not getting that activation and they're not decelerating the way i want to see them they'll decelerate or just by vice versa they haven't learned how to reactivate to get out of that position yet they're sloppy they're all over the place well if they're all over the place i don't want them doing offensive takeoffs yet sure where they actually have to step over and rotate, they don't know how to pivot and rotate correctly from that deceleration into that accelerated position. I don't want them doing it yet. Yeah. So I'll take the, the I don't want to say novices, but the ones that are, are just maybe haven't got it yet yeah. or are learning it, and we'll separate. You, I don't do any more than two groups, though. So okay. I don't have three different, hey, these guys are way advanced over here now. They could always use the, if they could potentially get to a, the next phase quicker, well, you know what? A little bit more time back here never hurts anything. Right. It's going back to the basics of any sport. You know what? If you can dribble and you got that down, you know what? It never hurts to do more dribbling drills. Right, right. Yeah, that's what, again, that's what I, I really liked about, you know, how you broke things down. That's why I wanted to bring you on the show is because you did it in a way that it's very, you know, very, you know, very step-by-step, -step, systematic, but simple, you know, in that, it's something that you can incorporate into pretty much anything, and I, I it started running with all the the ways that I can incorporate this into a program or how I can separate out. You know, I mean, anytime you do your cone drills, you decide where they go. They don't always need to know. No, no athlete wants to hear that they're less of an athlete. They don't want to hear that, but but you can decide. Hey, you're in this group or you're in that group, and, and make it part of your training and um and 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 coordinate that in a way that you can control the environment. You know, for sure. Um, you know, we're kind of at the, uh, wrapping up here, but you know, anybody that comes on the show, I always want to kind of get some some motivation here. So, give me a give me a quote that you have plastered in your weight room, or one that you live by. This is the this is it right here. Championships are earned; they're not given. No doubt. And I, I've lived and died with that for for years. I, I tell the kids that all the time. If you're not earning it, it's not going to get you. They're not going to give it to you. Sure. You gotta earn it. You gotta earn it. What's a uh, what's a book recommendation you have? Oh boy, Super Training is a great book. Yeah, uh, Mel like Siv. Actually, uh, I just got this. I don't know if you can see. I don't know if I'm gonna kill it here or not. I don't know if you can see that that book or not. Yeah. I just got this book, um, Special uh, Strength Training Manual for Coaches. Um, by Yuri, I'm not even gonna to try to pronounce his Bershansky. last name. Yeah, yeah. Bershansky. Yeah. You said it. Um, I haven't gotten into this book very far yet, but I already am in love with this book. I keep this yeah. book is like my summer reading book right here. <laughs> I always try to do a book a summer, and and I'm telling you, I don't, I haven't gotten into this before, but I'm, I'm I can't, I'm having a hard time not jumping ahead to some of the chapters. Yeah. Just, I mean, I think this is going to be an outstanding book. I don't know if you've read it or not yourself. I haven't read that one, no. But I've read some of Fershansky's work, yeah. I, th th this book looks pretty awesome. So I'm, I'm really psyched about getting into that book and, and learning, learning some stuff. 
give me a um, I know you have your website varietytrainer.com but give me a give me a website that, that you know when you're surfing the web that you go to every time uh, man there's a there are a couple go to's for me um, I like the diesel crew websites mm-hmm. both uh, now there's two different diesel crew websites um, uh, Jed Johnson who was my partner in orchestrating this DVD he's the He's like the brainchild behind the scenes. Um, he knows how to get the click banks. He, he does all the little things that I, I know. He basically got my knowledge and showed me how to get it out to the masses. Yep. Um, he's a big grip strength guy, holds some world records in grip strength, um, which I'm a big proponent of grip training. And then uh, uh, Jim Smith, uh, Smitty, he goes by Smitty. He's another diesel crew, diesel crew for strength. Um, He's got a phenomenal website, full, just packed full of outstanding information all the time. Uh, another guy I like to follow is uh, Joe Hashi. He's got a website called SynergyAthletics.com. Uh, I'm plugging these guys. So I don't know if they're ever going to know I'm plugging them or not. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I met him. I've gone up to it. I've traveled to his gym. and He, he lives up in New York. And I, I made the, the trip up there just to get in this gym and check it out and, you know, ask him questions. I mean, I, I'm, I'm like a golf – I'm constantly asking people questions, asking yep. other strength coaches. I mean, I, I can never learn enough. I, I only feel like I only know half of what I need to know in this world for, for this profession. Right. So I'm constantly trying to find little, little tidbits of information. So I, I keep – I know there's a couple other sites, but those are my like main go-to sites. One because I find the sites entertaining. Yep. Um, they keep my attention, and and I and I've picked up a lot of little tidbits of training from them. Um, you know, they don't just cover how to squat. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're they're, they're covering the the littler side things that you can maybe add an accessory to a program to add a little. <laughs> Yeah, to it for your athletes. A little spice, a little yeah, spice. a little spice, if you will. Yeah. What um, you know, now you buck, no, you're a smart guy up there. You guys, you guys have got freaking geniuses oh, on campus. Are smart ones, okay. <laughs> geniuses on your campuses, but yeah, too many. You know, what about a, a an app recommendation? Is there an app that you use with your athletes, or one that you see them using quite a bit? No, I, I'm not an app guy. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna be honest with you. Uh, I. Uh, uh, my my assistant Cassandra kind of makes fun of me um, because yes I have a, I actually have two websites and I do a lot on the computer but she goes you really don't know what you're doing do you because <laughs> um, I'm always asking her my mom or, or my wife uh, you know the computer the computer side of things because um, I'm always screwing things up on the computer yeah. um, so when it comes to technology with apps and things I'm, I'm kind of old school um, I got my own system that I use in the computer, but it's right. a home beat system. It's not nothing I bought or, or anything of that of that nature. I'm a Pandora guy. Does that count as an app? There you go. That's a good one. Pandora is perfect. That's a good one. No, I, hey, Jerry, I, you know, I, I appreciate you coming on, man. I, I, I did. I, I truly enjoyed your product. Um, you know, we're gonna make sure we plug that. You know, plug that here and, and tell people where they can get that. But, um, but, you know, it, definitely a, a phenomenal strength coach. You do a great job where you're at. You don't have 27 teams to manage it without being a, a great administrator and a, and, a, and a great coach. But I appreciate you coming on and spending some time with everybody and kind of just enlightening us a little bit and sharing your knowledge. And I, I know it's from the heart. You know, I know you produce, you know, uh, the DVD from the heart as a way to kind of give a, a – a, 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 roadmap to coaches maybe that that haven't had the experience working with um preventing the acl injuries but if you could play you know tell us a little bit you know again you know talk about your website and where they and and, and uh the website for the for the dvd and then i, I think you're working on an ebook too aren't you yeah um well the website my main website and, and the site that i really do spend the majority of my time on when i it's kind of like a hobby. I, I'm really into helping people out. Um, it's a, it's called VarietyTrainer.com. Um, I started it years and years ago, a couple years ago, uh, for actually summer programs. 
for my athletes at the college, uh, a place where they could go and find the exercises. Yeah. Um, and it gets kind of transformed into sharing that information with other coaches. Um, go to my website. It's a free website. You can get on there and you can see these exercises and how I'm coaching them and da 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 da. And, you know, and it turned into this blog and. You know, it kind of just transformed into now I've got my emails jam-packed all the time with coaches asking questions. Um, hey, can you do a post on yeah. this topic? Can you answer how, this question? So I'm constantly doing quick Q&A basically, but it helps for, for me to come up with topics for the post as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm a big it's just a fun website because um, I call it almost like it's a community because <laughs> a lot of the information I have on there is is, is the brainchild of people asking me questions. No question. No question. Um, and then I have another. I have I do have an ebook coming out. I, it's been in the pro, it's been in the work for over two years. So I'm not gonna lie. Um, I just uh, the computer side of things slows me down. It, the product itself has been done. But it's an ebook on um, core training. Um, what really goes on at the, at the collegiate level because uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about the core now they I mean everyone's got their own opinion about this and that and and, and training the core it, it, I get so many questions about what do you do for your abs and what do you do for your low back right and how do you incorporate the hips and, and with the transverse you know how do you get that contralateral type of contraction to maximize know an athlete's ability to get their entire core to actually add miles per hour to their lacrosse shot right or to a soccer players are coming across to to take a shot uh to kick a soccer ball i mean your core has to be activated you can add miles per hour to to your shots if you're if you're using your your midsection properly um so that's that's a project i've been working on um it, it kind of is a growing project. It just I, I finally put the brakes on it after 197 pages, I think. <laughs> uh, I have I've said, okay, that's that's it. Now I have – it's going to come out probably in about, I don't know, if I can get the computer stuff figured out, uh, about an, about three weeks from now to a month. Um, okay. That'll be on varietytrainer.com, and there's links to the other websites and stuff. Well, good, man. Well, hey, buddy, I appreciate you coming on, spending the time. I really do. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled. Thanks, Coach. You know, Ron, thanks a lot for the invite. I mean, guys, if you guys need anything, contact me through email or through my website. I mean, I'm a friendly guy. I'll answer the phone, but I'm usually not in my office very often. I hear you. Um, but, uh, you know, I help out whoever needs help, whatever I can do, and then I'll – if I get a coach on the phone, I usually try to steal information from them before I hang up, too. <laughs> I hear you, man. Well, I appreciate it, buddy. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks, buddy. All right, guys. A couple quick reminders before we let you go. Uh, as always, we'll have all the links that we mentioned in the episode down below in the show notes. So make sure you go to the show notes and uh, you know, make sure you check out his video. I, I think it's a great video. I think you'll get something out of it. So uh, there will be a link down there for that as well. Also, <clears throat> I've been working on strength on demand for uh, quite some time now, and we were getting very close to releasing this. So, uh, be on the lookout for strength on demand. Uh, make sure you go to our site and you are uh, on the mailing list or on some one of the social media um, platforms, and I'll be sure to uh, get this information out to you as soon as we release it. We're looking at probably. Uh, start of July, so we're, uh, that's kind of the tentative date. So I'll make sure to keep you updated, and I hope you have a great week, and we'll see you next week. Take care.